Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our 13th Saudi Ophthalmology Society webinar titled Ray of Hope for Libra's Hereditary Optic Neuropathy. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who's going to talk to us about an important and a bit rare optic neuropathy that can be overlooked or misdiagnosed by ophthalmologists. Our speaker today is Dr. Kayara Lamorja. Dr. Kayara is affiliated to IRCCS, the Institute of Neurological Science of Bulimia, and the Neurology Unit in Bilaria Hospital, Bologna, Italy. Dr. Lamarja has authored and co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed papers and six book chapters. She presented her work in many international and national conferences, and her scientific contribution have claimed recognition around the world. She received several awards and granted fundings. We are very happy and honored to have Dr. Kayara with us today. And I would like to remind our attendees to send us their questions and inquiries through the Q&A box below. Dr. Kayara, the floor is yours. Thank you very nice for the presentation. I will share my screen. And thank you for being here today. Okay, so we will talk about Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. Um, I'm a neurologist, I'm working in Bologna. These are my disclosures. So Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy is a disease characterized specifically by an affection of the optic nerve, which is the selective target of the disease. There are three things that need still to be fully explained about Leber's. The tissue su super specificity. In fact, retinal ganglion cells are the, the selective target of the disease in the last majority of cases the male prevalence and the incomplete penetrance of the disease. First of all, we have to talk about uh, the specificity of the um, retinal ganglion cells as target of uh, these mitochondrial optic neuropathies. In fact, retinal ganglion cells are characterized by skewed bioenergetic requirements. And this is uh, due because of the uh, organization of the retinal ganglion cells before and after the lamina cribrosa. In fact, in the prelaminar portion of the retinal ganglion cells, you do have this unmyelinated portion. And after the lamina cribrosa, the retinal ganglion cells became myelinated. These skewed organizations make the retinal ganglion cells particularly vulnerable to mitochondrial dysfunction. And this is due because if you can see this better in this image, in the am amyelinic part of the uh, retinal uh, of the optic nerve, you have high mitochondrial content and high energy requirements. After the lamina cribrosa in the myelinic part of the optic nerve, you do have less energy requirements. And because of this skewed organization, the retinal ganglion cells are uh, the selected ta target of the disease. In fact, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy is characterized by the preferential involvement of the papillomacular bundle, which runs from the optic nerve to the macula, with the selective atrophy, at least in the initial uh, stage uh, of the disease, of the temporal sector of the optic nerve, in which the parvocellular retinal ganglion cells are more vulnerable to mitochondrial dysfunction. So the, the disease usually starts from the papillomacular bundle. And the neurodegeneration in this disease follows a specific pattern. In fact, if you look at this post-mortem tissue from Leber's ca cases, usually you do have first an affection of the temporal and inferior side of the optic nerve. And then um, after the, the disease is progressing over time, you do have also the affection of the other quadrants of the optic nerve, which usually are affected later in the disease course. And if you also look at this 
post-mortem tissues of a labor's patient with the 3460 mutation and compare this axon to a control axon, you can see also a loss of myelin um, around the uh, axon and also a large amount of mitochondrial, uh, which reflects this mitochondrial dysfunction inside the optic nerve. So this disease was initially described in uh, 1859 by von Grefen and then by Leber in 1871. Uh, but the, the, the first genetic determination of the disease is uh, in 1988 from Doug Wallace, uh, who was the, uh, the one discovering the first uh, um, 11778 mutation affecting the complex one of the respiratory chain of the mitochondrial um, respiratory chain. And one of the rule of this disease, since it's due to mitochondrial DNA mutation, uh, the inheritance of the disease is typically a maternal inheritance. So only the female can transmit the genetic def defect to the um, siblings, but this disease cannot be transmitted by males because the, 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 the genetic cause is a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA. So it's not following the general rules of Mendelian in inheritance. The disease, as I said before, is characterized by an incomplete penetrance. Usually males are more affected than females in a ratio around five to one. The peak of the disease is around 15, 35 years, but we, um, we uh, know that there are also children can be affected by diseases and also uh, the disease can um, appear late, later in, in the life. The onset is typical acute subacute, and there is uh, some uh, possibility of spontaneous recovery, even though it, this recovery is um, never complete. Uh, as I said before, there is a preferential uh, loss of the papillomacular bundle that leads to optic nerve pallor. And uh, all, the, all the patients affected by this disease are characterized by complex one defect, even though it's usually a mild defect. So as I said before, there are some mysteries about this disease, but we do know that the, over 90% of cases are carrying uh, mtDNA point mutation. And these three are the three common uh, labels mutation, 11778, 3460, uh, 3, and 14484, which affects uh, um, subunit of the complex one of the respiratory chain. But we have to remember that besides these uh, three most common mutations, which cover the 90-90% of cases, there are also rarer mutations that uh, need to be uh, looked for if uh, the, the first mutation are negative, uh, especially for those cases uh, uh, for which the clinical suspicion is very high. Another not fully explained feature about labors is the uh, male prevalence. We do, we do know, in fact, that males are more uh, affected than females. So uh, carrying the mutation, they are more prone to develop the disease. The reason why males are more affected than females is still um, under uh, investigation. And for a long time, it was thought that the reason for this difference was related to uh, an X-linked Mendelian genetic issue. But the studies conducted in this direction were never concludes, never found the mutation in the X chromosomes, chromosome uh, able to explain this gender difference uh, between males and females. So one uh, possible explanation that probably is the most plausible explanation for, for this uh, gender uh, issue in labors is uh, related to estrogens. In fact, we do know that estrogens, which typically are um, relevant for gender differences, uh, are able to uh, increase the mtDNA copy number, which is known uh, as a compensatory strategy for the disease. In other words, the possibility to increase the mitochondrial biogenesis make the females more protected from the disease. And this is uh, st um, strictly linked also to the concept of uh, the incomplete penetrance of the disease, 
In fact, what we demonstrated in these uh, patients, if you compare the mtDNA content in controls, affected labors and people carrying the mutation but not manifesting the disease, you can see as carriers of mutation but not manifesting labors have an increased uh, mtDNA copy number. This means that the, uh, the mitobiogenesis is a compensatory strategy um, for the disease. Another important and relevant issue in uh, uh, the uh, disease is the role of the environmental factor. In fact, we do know usually that the peak of the disease is around 15, 30 years of age, but we also have later cases. And usually people who became affected in, uh, at older age, they are smoker. The reason why this is uh, um, relevant is that smoking is um, uh, somehow affecting the um, compensatory strategy of increasing mitochondrial biogenesis. In fact, if you look at this uh, um, picture and you, you compare people not smoking and people smoking, you can see that uh, smoker, smoking increased the uh, probability to be affected because it's adding an, an environmental toxic factor to the genetic predisposition. So there is a, a relevant role of uh, triggering factors, uh, especially for later cases. And this is demonstrated from, the, uh, from this graph. If you look at the people not smoking, you have the typical peak of disease onset at around 15, 20 years. But if you look at people smoking, this uh, peak is, uh, um, is uh, uh, postponed uh, to later ages. And this is, um, this, these people are probably people that never became affected if they never smoked. So for, um, it, for genetic counseling, when uh, we um, make a diagnosis of labors, also in terms of counseling or, or of uh, other uh, fami familiar cases, uh, it's very important to, to instruct these people not to smoking because this is a protective factor for the for the disease. The reason why the tobacco smoking is so relevant is that because, uh, as I said before, tobacco is, um, uh, is impacting the capability of the compensatory strategy of mitochondrial biogenesis. In fact, it lowers the, the mitochondrial DNA copy number, which I said before is a compensatory strategy for the disease. And if you compare affected people to carriers, the empty DNA copy number, uh, carriers of the uh, DNA mutation, empty DNA mutation compared to affected individuals, you can still have a compensatory capability in those, even in the presence of tobacco, but because the carriers are still able to increase mitochondrial biogenesis. So which are the most relevant uh, clinical features of labors? As I said before, you, you have this uh, presymptomatic stage that can remain like that all the life long, which is the, the status of carrying the mutation but not manifesting the disease. For uh, labors carrier, if you look at the fundus oculi of this patient, you can observe some swelling of the optic nerve fibers around the, the optic disc. And sometimes you have some abnormal color vision. And if you run OCT, you can uh, observe an increase of the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness compared to controls, which can be remain like that for all the life. When the disease starts, you move from the presymptomatic to the acute stage of the disease which is characterized typically by central vision loss without pain at high moments. And this differentiate labors from, for example, optic neuritis. And the, the, the onset of, of the visual loss can be bilateral in 25, 50% of cases. And the patient typically present a central scotoma. In unilateral presentation, the second eye becomes affected usually in six, eight weeks, 
uh, we even though we usually we don't have unilateral case, they are very, very rare. Visual loss progression in the first weeks uh, is very uh, fast, and the, usually the patient reaches the nadir of the visual uh, loss in four, six weeks. If you look at the fundus oculi of this patient, you can observe telangiectasia, macroangiopathy, optic disc hyperemia, and retinal nerve fiber swelling. As you can see, there is a very important increase of the uh, microangiopathy moving from the presymptomatic to the acute stage. A difference with inflammatory papillitis, fluorangiography in this patient is normal. So you don't observe a fluorescent leakage in these patients. And also brain MRI usually is normal. And this is a differential from multiple sclerosis and optic neuritis cases, for example. The peak of disease is usually between 15 and 30 years with some exception as I said before. Uh, so these are some images of the fundus oculi of um, patients affected by labors. And you see this uh, hyperemia of the optic disc, also this microangiopathy and the pseudoedema of the optic nerve fibers around the optic disc. Sometimes this edema can be very relevant. It can be confused by a real edema, which is not uh, as uh, you can found for uh, intracranial hypertension, a real edema, but it's uh, due to um, a mitochondrial stasis uh, at the axons of the optic nerve. When you move from the very early acute stage from to the uh, subacute stage of the disease, you can uh, initially observe the selective loss of the papillomacular bundle with this temporal atrophy of the optic nerve. Uh, so these are some examples of a patient in the acute stage for the first eye when the second eye is still no normal. And you can observe at the optic disc add this uh, important increase of the microangiopathy and the pseudoedema of the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. When this second eye starts to be affected, you can observe the same phenomenon for the other eye. The typical visual field defect is a sicocentral scotoma, uh, which affects the central part of the uh, visual field. And when you move to the chronic stage, which is usually um, reached after about uh, two months, you can uh, observe this optic nerve pallor, which is uh, uh, diffuse, uh, not involving only the temporal side, but all the uh, optic nerve. Uh, don't forget that in the advanced stage of the disease, you can also have some optic disc capping uh, as uh, you found for glaucoma patients. And the visual field defects progresses from the central scotoma to a gen generalized defect. There is some possibility for a spontaneous recovery, and this probability is much higher for the 14-4A4 mutation. And the probability of a spontaneous recovery can be up to 60-80% of cases. This um, probability is much lower for the other two mutations. Another important clinical uh, thing about labors is the pupil. In fact, uh, even in the very late stage of the disease, if you look at the pupillary light response in this patient, patient you can observe a sparing of the pupil light reflex, a difference with other optic nerve diseases. The reason why this pupil response is maintained in labors is due because of the um, sparing of melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. These cells uh, are a small sub subgroup of uh, retinal ganglion cells, which are very relevant for synchronization of circadian rhythms to the light dark cycle, but they are also involved in pupillary light reflex regulation. And we demonstrated in postmortem tissues of labor patients that these cells are relatively spared compared to the regular retinal ganglion cells. And this explains why these patients can maintain the pupil response even in the presence of a severe optic atrophy.
As I mentioned before, a very important tool in following the disease uh, is the OCT, the optical coherence tomography, which is a, a methodology which allows to measure the retinal nerve fiber thickness and the ganglion cell layer thickness with the segmentation analysis in these patients. And it's very important because we can quantify the progression of the disease over time. So if you look at the OCT finding in this disease and we moved from the asymptomatic carrier stage to the acute stage and the chronic stage, what you observe is in first an increase in the inferior and temporal sector of the optic nerve. In the acute stage, this increase is uh, more evident and more uh, prominent and starts to involve also the superior sector the, the last sector to, uh, to undergo increase in thickness is the nasal one, and the same pattern in terms of atrophy is uh, repeated. So the first sector undergoing atrophy are the temporal and the inferior, and the last sectors undergoing atrophy are the superior and nasal. And in the chronic stage, the OCTs demonstrate a complete optic nerve atrophy. This is um, depicted in these images. So you have this uh, important increase in thickness in the inferior and temporal, then in the superior, and finally in the nasal sector, which it can be followed over time. And uh, this it is um, quite uh, um, um, specific uh, pattern of Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. Even though there are some patients uh, in, in which you cannot observe this important increase in thickness, but for those undergoing these pseudoedema features, you can find this specific pattern very, very regularly. So uh, if, you, if, if we think about the natural history of the disease, we do have this asymptomatic labor carrier stage. Then we have this subacute stage, which goes from the onset of the visual loss to six months, then the dynamic phase stage, which is from six to 12 months, and finally the chronic stage. It's important also to specify that even before the patient is able to uh, complain or manifest a visual loss, if you look at the ganglion cell, so uh, looking at the segmentation analysis of the ganglion cell layer, even before that you can see anything at the level of the retinal nerve fiber layer, you can observe some ganglion cell layer defect at the optic nerve, which is very, very early. Other more uh, uh, recent uh, technique that can be applied for uh, study uh, the retinal features and the, also the vascular feature of labors are uh, offered by Anjo OCT in which you can see uh, some changes in the choroidal, choroidal thickness, which follow the retinal nerve fiber changes in labors, but also some change, changes in the peripapillary vessel density. So uh, overall, when we have to, um, to think about labors, when uh, to have a clinical suspicion, when uh, we do have a young male, especially, with the bilateral acute subacute visual loss without pain in eye movements. The brain MRI is negative for the demyelinating lesions. We cannot see any leakage at angiography. Uh, at the fundus oc oculi, we observe some microangiopathy, optic disc hyperemia, and pseudoedema of the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer. And at the uh, ophthalmological uh, evaluation, the, relevant, the relative afferent pupillary uh, defect is not so obvious uh, than uh, we can observe for optic neuritis, for example. And the other thing is that labor hereditary optic neuropathy patient, they don't go uh, through a spontaneous recovery or after steroid therapy uh, improve, improvement of vision. And we always have to ask about the family history because we can find other affected individuals along the maternal line. So in those cases, we have to ask for a genetic testing for labors, looking first for the three most common mtDNA labors mutation, 
But don't forget that there are rarer uh, mutation in the mtDNA. In that, in those cases, if the clinical suspicion is very high, it's important also to look at the entire mtDNA DNA sequence. And usually, we prefer to look at this uh, using urines instead of blood because urine is a more, uh, you know, stable tissue, uh, and some mutation can be a eliminate by the blood. A another um, important message is that this is the classical labors and this is the well-known labors, but most re more recently uh, we described also um, a recessive form of labors. Uh, and in this case, the um, causative gene is this DNA JC30 nuclear gene. And uh, of course, in this case, uh, the genetics of the disease is following the Mendelian, Mendelian rules. And this nuclear variant of labors is particularly common in people coming from East Europe. And there is also a possible founder effect. So in terms of phenotype, these cases are completely, completely uh, identical to the classical labors. So we have to think about also to this possibility if the uh, searching of our uh, mtDNA mutation are completely negative. As I mentioned before, there are some uh, positive prognostic factors for the disease. One of these prognostic factors positive is the onset in the childhood uh, stage because people uh, that became affected before 10 years of, of age are usually undergoing a less severe course of the disease. And also there is a higher probability of recovery for the 14 uh, for a four mutation. And also people having a larger optic disc sites, they are um, undergoing more probable uh, visual recovery. If you look at this uh, uh, vertical diameter of the optic disc, you do have uh, uh, higher, um, optic disc diameter for people never uh, becoming affected. Uh, uh, as I mentioned in the first slide of the presentation, usually labors is the disease affecting only the optic nerve. And this is true for the vast majority of cases. There are rare cases in which you can observe some plus phenotypes associated with the classical labor mutation. And these plus phenotypes uh, range from migraine, rare myoclonus, peripheral neuropathy, MS-like, heart conduction defects, hearing loss, and very rare Lee syndrome cases. The, the most controversial association is the association between uh, labor mutation and multiple sclerosis, because there are some families for which it has been described the association of these two entities. However, if you look at these epidemiological studies, uh, trying to understand if this association is real causal or coincidental, this, uh, um, this studies was run uh, looking also a systematic review of published cases and included also a meta-analysis of stud studies screening patients for, with an MS for labor mutation. Uh, the conclusion of this study is, is that although the occurrence of MS and labor mtDNA mutation is likely to be a, due to a chance, the resulting disorder as a distinct phenotype implicating a possible mechanistic interaction of the mitochondrial DNA mutation and the MS phenotype. And we now move to the therapeutic option in labors. It's very important to remember that this disease is characterized by a peculiar natural history, which moves from the asymptomatic stage to the chronic stage of the disease, which is usually reached after one year from onset. And uh, different st strategies have been uh, investigated and developed over uh, the time. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of those are antioxidants, some of those are anti-apoptotic drugs, 
And there, there is also some matobiogenesis and gene therapy option for the disease. Uh, in this, uh, uh, this regard, the early clinical diagnosis of labors is very important because there are therapeutic options for the disease. The only uh, drug uh, up to now approved for, um, for labors is idibenone. Idibenone is an antioxidant drug which is um, reduced to idibenol by NCO1 in the cytosol. And the result of this uh, um, drug is to bypass the complex one defect, which is typical for labors, because idibenone is able to shuttle electrons directly to complex three. Uh, this drug was investigated from, since uh, starting from 2005, initially uh, through a randomized placebo-controlled trial, which involved 85 labor patients in 2005. And, five. and then uh, moving from this uh, um, uh, initial stage, um, the drug reached the approval uh, in the EU in 2015. Idibenone can be prescribed in Italy for free under the rules of rare diseases uh, with an IFA web prescription in patients uh, older than 14, 14 years of age and the disease duration less than one year. The treatment can, uh, must be so, uh, administered at the dosage of 900 milligrams per day and can be continued until a stabilization is reached after two consecutive follow-ups at six months interval. Uh, the prescription of this drug uh, has been um, established and the, these rules have uh, been established after an, an international consensus, consensus, consensus statement on the clinical and therapeutic management of labors. The results, as I said before, uh, about the uh, use of idibenone in labors comes from a retrospective study that we published in 2011, and also the results of the RODOS trial uh, that have been published in 2011 in the, in the same uh, number of the, the uh, brain journal. And if you look at, uh, also at our retrospective data and you compare the um, probability of recovery in idibenone treated patient compared to untreated patients, you move from uh, 32 to 45.5%. And uh, the, the duration of the treatment is higher for those people recovering vision than those not recovering vision. Uh, I, I would like to remember that the trial, the RODOS trial was conducted uh, with the uh, interventional uh, period of six months treatment. But if you look at the results of the ex expanded program, uh, of people who continued the, the therapy over time, and uh, you look at the proportion of patients with a clinically relevant recovery, you can observe as this probability it beca becomes higher over time, which means that uh, a longer duration of treatment make more uh, probable, uh, more uh, relevant uh, the uh, probability to recover vision. And these results uh, are highlighted also in this recent paper. And if you look at the baseline, baseline uh, visual acuity, nadir, which means the lowest uh, visual acuity and the last vis uh, visual acuity of this patient, uh, the, these are you know, related to the months of treatment, uh, of idibenone treatment. You can observe uh, that at the last visit, uh, uh, the patient uh, um, present an increase of visual acuity compared to the nadir, which is clinically relevant. Other drugs under investigation in labors are AP743, uh, which is similar uh, to uh, vitamin E in terms of uh, bio biochemical structure. And the results of this open label trial, which is closed, have been published, demonstrating in some cases some improvement. This is another drug which belongs to the class of antioxidants, 
and uh, uh, a prospect prospective uh, randomized double mass vehicle control phase two clinical study uh, has been conducted in an only recruiting center, which is <clears throat> in Los Angeles, the INEI Center, and been completed in April 2020. Uh, even though the results of this uh, uh, trial have, have not been uh, published yet. Another possible approach uh, for treating, treating this patient and preventive strategy, as I mentioned before, one of the most effective strategy for caries is to increase the mitochondrial biogenesis and the mtDNA content so, and if you remember that females are less uh, prone to develop the disease compared to males, one possible uh, approach is targeting estrogen receptor uh, in order to increase the, the compensatory strategy of mitochondrial biogenesis. Another uh, therapeutic approach other, uh, under investigation for labors is the gene therapy. Uh, this gene therapy uh, is, is based uh, to the allotopic um, expression strategy, uh, which means uh, to um, use a AV2 vector in which uh, you have an ND4 gene construct, which is recorded by the nucleus and targeted by um, mitochondrial targeting sequencing to mitochondrial. And uh, through an intravitreal injection, it's possible um, to uh, protect retinal ganglion cells against the 11778 mutation. Up to now, only this mutation have been, has been uh, targeted by a gene therapy approach. And there are three groups in the world um, applying this uh, approach, which are based in Miami, uh, in France, and in China. The results uh, of this phase three uh, double masked trial uh, have been recently published, and this trial involved 76 labor patients, and uh, only patient with, patients with a disease duration uh, less than one year were included in this trial, one up to six months and the other one over six months. And also our center was um, involved in this uh, uh, trial. As I said before, the results have been published and uh, what um, is evident from these results and that is, is that uh, the patient demonstrated a mean improvement of 15 letters for the injected eye, but also of 13 letters for the, for the in, uh, you know, uninjected eye. So this trial was based to a, a sham controlled approach for which uh, you have the injection injection only in one eye, but the other eye is not injected. So the second eye is uh, behaving as a control eye. And because of the bilateral improvement, uh, the primary endpoint of the study was not reached. The reason why there is this bilateral improvement, improvement of vision uh, is possibly explained, explained by the fact of the migration of the virus along the chiasm in fact, if you look at the injected side and the contralateral side, you can see that there is evidence of uh, AV2 traces in the retina, in the optic nerve, in the optic chiasm, in the optic tract, and the lateral geniculate nucleus also of the contralateral eye. And this can explain the bilateral improvement demonstrated in these patients. Um, also, the results of the rescue trial, which involved patients with a disease duration up to six months have been published. And uh, also in this case, you have a mean improvement uh, for uh, at a two-year follow-up, which is of uh, about a mean improvement of 28 letters compared to the sham treated eyes of 24. Um, and this, this is for the reverse trial and this is for the rescue trial. And if you compare these two trials, um, you can see that this improvement is uh, even uh, more uh, relevant, uh, possibly for the reverse trial than for the rescue trial. And if you compare the results of the gene therapy trials to the natural history of the disease, 
um, you can see that uh, the improvement of vision is uh, behaving different from the natural history of the disease in which you have this uh, uh, worsening of vision over time. And this uh, worsening, um, it seems to be reverted by the uh, therapeutic approach. The last trial under uh, evaluation, uh, which has been closed in June uh, uh, 2019, is the REFLECT trial. In this case, uh, the injection uh, has, has been done in both eyes with uh, one arm of patients uh, undergoing injection in both eyes and one arm of patients undergoing injection only in one eye. And as you can see, uh, for those patient, uh, patients who underwent injection in both eyes, uh, uh, the mean improvement of visual acuity was higher. In terms of safety of this gene therapy approach, uh, there are um, common ad adverse events which are related uh, to anterior chamber inflammation and vitreitis, which uh, um, were quite common in the uh, cohorts of patients, uh, even though usually they were not severe and uh, can be treated with steroids. And I would like to conclude with this uh, clinical case, which is a 16-year male who underwent a bilateral acute visual loss without pain on January 2019. This young male uh, was uh, um, also uh, presenting some other relatives affected by labors, and he was carrying uh, this 11778 mutation. He started ther ther therapy with Idibenon after two months from onset. And because of the enrollment ro in, in the gene therapy trial, he has to stop the, the, the therapy. And if you look at the fundus images of this patient, you can observe uh, this swelling, uh, very important actually, optic nerve fiber swelling, which is evident in both eyes. And you have this central scotoma which is more dense in the right eye than in the left eye. And this corresponds to this uh, higher ganglion cell layer defect in the um, right eye compared to the left eye. Uh, through the disease course, uh, you have this enlargement of the central scotoma and the enlargement of the ganglion cell defect, even though the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer around the optic disc, they are all, uh, still very uh, swollen. And uh, the disease progresses over time, in, in, and you have this uh, loss of visual acuity. And you can observe of, over time that the ganglion cell layer defect de became, became, became generalized. And the, the, the defect of the temporal sector of the optic nerve, and as you can see, of the papillomacular uh, bundle became obvious. This is the last follow up of the, of the patient, demonstrating also a reduction of the central scotoma and an improvement of visual acuity. And here you can see the obvious temporal defect in both sides and uh, the, the complete um, stabilization of the ganglion cell layer defect over time. And uh, with this, I would like to thank all the people working with me, ophthalmologists, neurologists, and also people in the lab, lab. And I would like to thank you for the attention. And also I would like to remember uh, in order, since I, uh, I said that it's very, very important to have an early diagnosis of the disease but, uh, because there are therapeutic options, uh, to have a very early genetic testing, which is very important to run as soon as possible. And uh, for um, info information about this, you can contact um, the person indicated here. Thank you again for your attention. And I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, I cannot. I cannot hear. Sorry. 
Sorry. Thank you okay. for, for a very informative and interesting lecture. Uh, we'll go through some of our questions. Uh, Dina asked about how to get access for the genetic testing. And I think your last slide uh, probably answered her question. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Muhammad is uh, saying that uh, he always thought that genetic therapy is the only solution for hereditary optic neuropathy, but it's good to know that there is other options. Uh, he's asking, um, please share your follow-up experience with patients uh, with her uh, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy who got the genetic therapy. Do they get useful vision? Okay. Uh, so what I would say, based on my experience, because we were involved in the gene therapy trials, is that uh, some of the patients, they, they had a, a good improvement of visual function, but not all of them. And this applies also, you know, to other therapeutic strategies. Uh, for example, also for a day on, uh, we do have people who respond very well to the drug and other people who do not. So maybe there are also other, you know, uh, specific genetic factors that can um, impinge on the response to therapies in general. Uh, so yeah, this is my experience. I would say that not all of them, they manifest improvement of vision. Another question, is steroid has any role in this disease? Sorry? Is steroid, IV steroid, has any role in this hmm. uh, disease? So uh, this is a very interesting question because uh, actually most of the patients, uh, at least in the past, they were all treated with steroids because uh, the initial diagnosis for, for, was for all of them <laughs> optic neuritis. But I would say no improvement was obvious after this uh, treatment. Maybe there is some influence uh, on this congestion, which is evident, evident of the, at the optic nerve head, but there is no demonstration of the clinical relevance of this uh, treatment for labors. Another question, what do you think about the online sources for idipinone? Is it uh, effective and can we trust the, those uh, sources? I mean, there are many uh, possibility. Uh, if you run uh, around the web, you can find many supplements with adibenone, but you know, there, there is no certification and uh, the process uh, uh, that leads to the approval of the drug was very long. There was also a lot of, of uh, uh, information um, acquired for the clinic from the clinical trial, but also as I showed before from the expand access program. And these people were, you know, under the regulatory uh, aspects of the, the trial and the follow-ups. So I'm not sure, you know, using uh, these uh, supplements online will be safe as we can uh, uh, be trust other uh, uh, reg regulated uh, drug for the disease. I would like to ask about the pediatric dose. Do you, uh, below the 14 year, do you give them? And what is it the same as adults? Okay, so usually I use uh, idibenone also for children. Uh, and you know, uh, we cannot prescribe uh, um, uh, the com commercially available drug for uh, the children because it's approved only after 14 years of age, but we can use an equivalent uh, for those under uh, 14. And in those cases, uh, usually I use a lower dosage, uh, which uh, can be adjusted based on the weight of the children. Because, you know, if you have a 13 uh, year uh, patient with a weight uh, resembling an adult, I'm using the 900 milligram. But if I have a six year old, I'm using usually lower dosage. Also, I'm checking the blood exams to be sure that there is no safety issues going on because uh, usually we are checking the liver and um, uh, blood counts just to be sure that, that there is no safety issues uh, ongoing, for, especially for children. Thank you. Uh, another question, is there a role for hormonal therapy as a protective factor? Mm -hmm. 
So as I showed before, um, I was mentioning the role of estrogens, which is very relevant because we know that there is this gender imbalance. And we had some patients, uh, female patients, uh, who became affected after you know, menopause. So for those cases, if we know that in the family there are other affected individuals, we usually have some consult consultant with the gynecologist following uh, the, the female. And we agreed also some hormonal replacement therapy uh, in order to avoid the, the estrogen decline, which is related to menopause. Yeah. Another question, do you expect that not all patient are improved due to presence of more than one gene uh, hmm. responsible for the disease. Yeah, the lack of response also to drugs can be related also to genetic variant in, in other genes may be implicated in the metabolism of the drug. And uh, we are not quite sure that, uh, you know, the response uh, can be uh, explained by other genetic factors. I am quite sure this is relevant, yeah. Um, we have also uh, one question whether if we don't have OCT in their institute, is it uh, still uh, we can follow those patients? Yeah, um, actually, as I said, OCT is very useful in quantifying and follow the patient over time, especially, you know, for um, uh, for those people who, who are not complaining um, a visual, a clinical visual loss, if you look at the ganglion cell layer, you can, you can see a defect even before the, the clinical manifestation. But there are also some fundus uh, aspects which are very, very uh, specific of labors. As I said before, this hyperemia of the optic disc, the microangiopathy, and also the pseudo edema is very specific. And uh, this progression over time, also the um, initial uh, loss of papillomacular bundle fibers, uh, which is very fast, is very typical. And um, usually, you know, you are not missing the, this diagnosis, especially for people starting bilaterally with the central scotoma. And even though you don't have OCT, I think that this uh, diagnosis can be reached also based on the lack of response to, to therapy, uh, steroids therapy. Uh, also important thing that you mentioned that sometimes they don't have relative efferent papillary defect and some of those patients might consider non-organic uh, visual loss or malingering. So always keep in mind that maybe sometimes the, the pupil will still be reactive. Uh, um, another uh, uh, comment uh, from our, one of our attendees, thank you so much for the nice lecture, and he would like to, you to leave the contact information for future contacts. Okay, I'm, I'm very happy to, to leave, a, should I write the, my email contact in the chat or where? Yeah, I think that will be great, yes. Okay. Please. So I will, I will write uh, in the chat so you can uh, share with the others. And before we conclude, we have one last question. Uh, the role for BAP to evaluate the optic uh, nerve during the acute attack. The role of, sorry? The uh, visual evoked potential. Okay. So uh, usually we are using uh, visual evoked potential in the acute stage of the disease. But the problem is that uh, for both optic neuritis and labors, you do have uh, the same pattern. I mean, you do have an increased latency of the P100, uh, and you have this, this decrease of the amplitude of the response. So it's not so useful for the differential diagnosis, even though usually for labors, you do have a more important loss of amplitude compared to the very significant increase of latency that is more typical for inflammatory um, variant, you know. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we really enjoyed your talk, Dr. Kayara, and we would like to thank you for, for it. I will leave you now uh, with uh, Mr. Morty for IQVI team uh, to present their IQVIA uh, space healthcare professional platform.
for the Saudi Ophthalmological Society. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Kayara, for this. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, hello all. Thank you, Kayara, for your wonderful uh, webinar. It's really you interesting. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Diana, for, uh, for this opportunity. So let me uh, quickly uh, go through our platform. So uh, it's really our pleasure to present our HC, IQVIA HCP space uh, holistic network and learning platform for healthcare professional with the members of Saudi, Saudi Ophthalmological Society. Adding to it, more than 60,000 plus uh, healthcare professional are registered with our platform in more than 50 specialities from Africa, India, and the Middle East. Also, I would like to share with you all a short video about our platform. It won't take much time. So it's a short video. I, I, I'm going to present it for you. Thank <laughs> you. 